activity as had been done for thousands and thousands of years since the beginning of agriculture. And so this increased productivity due to the development of science and technology, high-yielding varieties, how to restore soil fertility to worn-out soils, how to control weeds and insect pests, uh, and I find it a couple to demonstrate what that package was able to do on thousands of small plots on farmers' fields so that you could get modifications in government economic policies, such as the availability of fertilizer. The credit for the small farmer to buy that fertilizer at time of planting and pay for it at harvest, and then a fair price at harvest that reflected the international price of the wheat or maize or uh, rice at that particular time. All of those pieces had to come together. And now, why don't you give us... I'm sorry, uh, I don't mean to cut you off, so go on. Uh, why don't you give us a little idea of what the difference in yield in when the when the Green Revolution really exploded, what was the difference in yield per acre? How much more food did the, the dwarf species and so on and the fertilizer and the government programs allow allow farms? What, what factor did it jump up by? Okay, in the case of Pakistan and India, when this technology was first increased or introduced experimentally, on experiment stations, and a bit later on small farms. Uh, with the old varieties and the old practices, even under irrigation, uh, yields were on the order of uh, 10 to 11 bushels per acre of wheat. Uh, with the new technology, uh, the package together, all of it manipulated and managed properly, would produce... 75, 85 bushels per acre instead of 10 or 11. So it was many fold. And the, uh, when you've got a, a package of practices like this and demonstrate it on 10,000 or many thousands of small plots on farmers' fields, not on experiment stations, these are little farmers. They, they may be uh, illiterate can't read or write, but they can. They know exactly what that implication is from the standpoint of feeding their families better and having something to sell and to begin to buy some of the basic needs. And that's what happened. Yeah, and uh, that is a big jump. We'll give people a moment to crawl back onto their chairs after that. <laughs> but uh, uh, do you and think... And, of course, when this was going on, these two books that... Uh, Leon Hesser has just mentioned uh, Population Monster by Paul Ehrlich and the one by uh, Famine 1975 by the Paddock Brothers were a burden that was we were carrying on our backs when it came to try to modify uh, pricing policies, economic policies that permitted these small farmers to adopt a new technology. All of this was uh, extra weight on our back. Now, what I find interesting is, as you said, those two books, uh, Paul Ehrlich's book and the Brothers' book, uh, were accurate if there had not been a Green Revolution. What fascinates me is the number of people that still quote those books and still act like the Green Revolution didn't happen. Do you have some sort of feeling on why uh, why people like to talk doomsday when there should have been uh, a huge celebration for the work you did? Not that you would have participated in the celebration. You're too busy working. But for the rest of us, those of us who are lazy, why isn't everyone celebrating the Green Revolution as well, much as I think I think that because of the fact the Green Revolution didn't solve all the hunger and famine problems in the world. Uh, there are still large numbers of people who are hungry uh, and sometimes verging on famine. Uh, for example, sub-Saharan Africa has been uh, all of those uh, 35, 40 countries. Uh, 
the food production per acre of the basic crops has been going down for the last three decades. And this is one of the areas where we're still uh, struggling to get moving in changing this technology. But even in India today, there's still a lot of poverty. Uh, people still with their hands out uh, begging for money to buy more food. Uh, in China, they have done a much better job of distributing the food more equitably than in India. And I think part of that is because of the lack of uh, general education in India, because in China, from the time of uh, uh, fairly early on, uh, primary schools were available to virtually all children in the areas, except those in very isolated mountainous areas. And this uh, has uh, continued to provoke uh, a better understanding of all of these problems. Now, uh, and why? I can, uh, you see, I'm conditioned by this hunger and misery properties back home here in our own country in the uh, deep depths of the depression of the early 1930s. I saw it. I saw the banks go broke in rural areas. There was food everywhere. People were in the cities. My first visit to Minneapolis was a horrifying experience in 1933. Hundreds of people with their hands out asking for nickels to buy bread. Unemployment everywhere. And uh, once, uh, do you think we've hit our head? The Green Revolution went and turned, uh, you know, uh, many factors from, uh, as you said, up to like, 80 bushels an acre. Do you think we can do more than that? I mean, the population of Earth is supposed to level off at about 10 billion. Is it possible for the Earth to feed 10 billion people? I say yes. The, but the, the more difficult of that problem is to distribute that food equitably once it's produced. Uh, but in order to make sure that we're going to be able to produce that uh, 10 million without destroying the environment is uh, we have to have continuing uh, good funding on a stable continuing basis for additional research and the, the new biotechnology or transgenic uh, uh, movement of genes across borders that were impossible before modern technology of the last 25 years uh, is important to this uh, uh, meeting the target. I'm going to take a, a a little break now. I want to tell people that my uh, my guests are Dr. Norman Borlaug, who won the uh, Nobel Peace Prize in 1970, has fed hundreds of millions of people by uh, by kickstarting the Green Revolution, and still continues uh, at 92 years old to work uh, to feed the world. Uh, my other guest is Leon Hesser, who wrote the book The Man Who Fed the World, which is a uh, biography of Norm, uh, Dr. Norman 